today I am ready to do battle for the kingdom of God, and so we are going to continue with Pastor's series on the giver and his gifts. And I'm going to be specifically talking about motherhood and how it is a reflection of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to dive right in. I hope you have your Bibles ready. And my first point that we're going to be speaking about today is the Holy Spirit is our helper. And as mothers, we are our children's helper. So first scripture I'm going to be uh, referencing is John 16, verse 7. It says, Nevertheless, I will tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, I will send him to you. So the Holy Spirit is given to us to teach us and to fill us with wisdom and understanding of the word. We are able to have our own constant, personal, immediate, indwelling contact with God. And when we have the help uh, in, in, with God, when we have the helper with us. So the Holy Spirit is readily available to every one of us. And having the Holy Spirit dwell within us is your own personal connection to God. So let's talk about how mothers reflect the Holy Spirit as a helper. So... I want to kind of go back to the very beginning and talk about God's design for women as helpers. So when we look in Genesis, we see that God first created man, and then God saw that man needed a companion or a helper. So in Genesis 2, verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone, and I will make him a helper fit for him. So God brought all of creation the beasts and the birds, to the man to see if they were a good fit. Uh, But none would suffice. So God went back, he did some work, and he created Eve. And Eve came from the rib of Adam, and he saw that she was a good fit. You hear that? I'm a good fit. (laughs) Just making sure you're listening. (laughs) So, So let's talk about what God said at the end of that verse. He said, I will make him a helper fit for him. A helper is defined as one who supplies strength in the area that is lacking in the helped. So this term does not imply that the helper is either stronger or weaker uh, than the one being helped. So Eve was created to fill a void that Adam simply could not do by himself. So Eve went on to have children, and she became the very first mother of the Bible. And her very name means life giver. So she was blessed with children to care for in a way that only she was capable of doing. She was created to bring forth life and help her family have dominion over all of the earth and teach them about God. So as a mother, there are many ways we can help our children. And I have two specific subpoints that I'm going to talk about. The first one is, um, as a mother, we can help them by loving them. And you may be thinking, well, duh, you know, I love my kids. But just hear me out. So um, Pastor Beck actually mentioned this scripture earlier when we were dedicating the babies. And it's Psalms 127, verses 3 through 5. And it says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. So we see that the Bible tells us that children are a heritage. They are something that is passed down from the Lord. Usually when you're passing down something from one generation to another, It's something that's special, it's significant, it has value. And as mothers, we have been blessed to inherit such a beautiful and valuable gift from the Lord. And in order for that beautiful and that valuable gift to prosper and to flourish, it needs to be loved and valued for what it's worth. So if you look through the Bible, you'll see that love is a big theme throughout the Bible, and love is very very important to God. And God commands us to love one another, and love is even listed as the first fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's very important. So I found this quote. It's from Jenny Monchamp. She's a Christian children's author, and I thought it was really fitting for this section of my notes. It says, show your children God's love by uh, by loving them and others as Christ loves you. 
Be quick to forgive. Don't hold a grudge. Look for what's best and speak gently into the areas of their life that needs growth. So sometimes it can be hard to speak gently into the areas of their life that needs growth, especially when they're bickering all the time and throwing Legos or magnetiles across the living room. And literally, when I was working on my sermon at this specific point, magnetiles were flying like missiles across my living room. So I put it in there. <laughs> so that's the current season that I'm in right now. It's okay. You may have older children that know better than to fight and throw toys at each other, but maybe you're dealing with some more mature situations that are straining your relationship with your children. But the one thing that I try to remember in those moments of frustration is that they sin just like I do. They need the love and salvation of Jesus Christ just like I do. They fail just like I do. And if Jesus can be gracious, patient, kind, and loving with me, even when I mess up royally, and guys, I do mess up royally, then I have no excuse not to show that same love, grace, mercy, and patience towards my own children, no matter what. I've got to get into the mindset of Christ when raising my children. Our God-given job is to love them and to lead them to their creator. And that brings me to my next sub-point. So another way that mothers can help their children is by teaching them. So in Genesis 4, verse 26, it says, To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So Seth was born to Eve after the tragic conflict between Cain and Abel. And we can see that from this verse, Seth's son, Enosh, and the people at that time, and the people of that time were calling upon the name of the Lord. How did they know to call upon the name of the Lord? It was because Adam and Eve were teaching their children about God, and that continued to trickle down from generation to generation. Here's another scripture I really like, and I got lots of scriptures, guys, so just hang in there with me. <laughs> so Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. So the last, over the last seven years um, that I've been parenting, it's probably been the hardest job I've ever had to do, even harder than nursing school. But raising children has also been one of the most rewarding jobs for me. One thing I've always worried about, though, in the back of my mind, and I'm sure I'm not the only mom or dad who think about this, is questioning myself if I'm doing this whole mom thing right. Am I teaching them what I need to be teaching them about God? And are they, am I teaching them enough? Do I need to be spending more time on this or that? Am I missing anything? Are they even getting what I'm throwing at them? All these questions begin to populate in my mind and doubt can start to set in and kind of eat away at me. But then I realize, but then something amazing will happen and I, uh, on something maybe that I've taught them and even when I thought they weren't paying attention, and they just blow my mind, such as maybe recalling a Bible story we talked about two weeks ago or listening to or hearing them sing some praise and worship while they're just over here independently playing. So my oldest, I've been teaching him how to read. He um, is just about to finish first grade. And as most of you know, we homeschool. And it has always been a dream of mine to homeschool my kids. But little did I know how sanctifying it would be. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Hey, you're not there to do it. It's me. <laughs> and, <laughs> I love you, babe. Well, last year, we began working on reading. And I all, I thought he would never, ever get it. We drilled letters and we, we read our little books and I would teach him until I was blue in the face. And it just seemed like he was just not interesting or he, he just didn't want to do it. He wanted to play. I was terrified that he was going to get behind and then I was going to be a failure because I failed my kids on teaching them basic reading skills. But, um, so here comes all this doubt and frustration flooding into my mind on what a failure I am. But one day, y'all, it just happened. He just started reading. This light bulb went off, and it was, like, super bright. I was like, wow, 
And even today, he's doing so good with his reader. I'm just amazed at how far he's come. And he's now reading his Bible to me during our Bible time school. And just this morning, as I was getting ready um, in the bathroom, curling my hair, he goes and gets his Bible out of his school bag and brings it in there and sits down with me. He goes, Mom, I'm going to read you a Bible story this morning. No prompting or anything. So we read about the Tower of Babel. But he just sat there and he read, and I was just so stinking proud of him. So he, had, he didn't have any help from anyone. It's something that I'd, I taught him that. And I, I did learn from this situation that while it may be that they're not getting it or they're not interested, they really are soaking up something. They really are listening. They're learning. The Bible says we are to train our children in the way they should go. It never says that training would be easy, but being consistent and faithful to the task will pay off, and you will see the fruit of your work. We are their coaches, and sometimes when we're training our children, it can be hard and frustrating, and you just want to throw the towel in sometimes. That we can't. We can't do that. They're watching us, and they're learning from us. So we as mothers and fathers have to make the decision. We're either going to let the world raise our children, or we're going to let the Word raise our children. I'm going to say that again. We're going to let the world raise our children, or we're going to let the Word do it. So knowing that they are soaking up everything, it is important that we walk out our faith strongly in front of them and teach them the Word. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 7, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. And these words I command to you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. So there's nothing in that verse that says, suggests or just kind of hints that maybe you should do that. It is a commandment that we as mothers and fathers are to teach the love of God and the word of God to our children. Talking about God and his word should be completely interwoven into your days. Sharing the word of God with our family shouldn't take a back seat to our schedules, but our schedules should revolve around family time with the Lord. We only have so much time on this earth to make an impact for the kingdom of God. So moving on to my next point, point number two. The Holy Spirit is our corrector, and as mothers, we are our children's corrector. So our first point was helper. Now we're talking about corrector. So talking about the Holy Spirit as our corrector, in 2 Timothy um, verse, or chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for the, for the teaching, for, the showing, for showing people what is wrong in their lives and for correcting faults and for teaching us how to live right. As believers, we will experience that prompting or the, you know, nudge from the Holy Spirit in our lives when we are doing things that God does not want us to do or we shouldn't be doing. For example, sometimes we may not want to forgive someone for wronging us. The Spirit keeps reminding you and reminding you and reminding you some more that you got to forgive just because, because God has forgiven us. And so another example is that you may get that uneasy feeling when you're doing something that you know you shouldn't be doing. There's that pull and tug between your flesh and the Holy Spirit. Your flesh is like, yeah, you know, it's, it's all right. Go ahead and watch that rated R horror movie. And, you know, so-and-so watched it last week and was going on and on about how great it was. But the Holy Spirit's like, mm -mm, nope, you better not do that. That's not a good idea. You don't want to be filling your mind with that junk and opening them demonic doors. It's not for God. Don't do it. Thank goodness, y'all, that we have a Holy Spirit to keep us in check like that. Now, whether or not you actually follow through with what the Holy Spirit is prompting you is ultimately your decision. But we are to be set apart from this world, and the Holy Spirit is doing its job by nudging us when we are starting to waver. So let's talk about how mothers reflect 
the Holy Spirit as a corrector. Hebrews 12, verse 11 says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So discipline and bringing correction is definitely not the fun part of parenting. Um, this is the part of parenting that many don't like to do. Many may disagree, upon different, uh, disagree on how to do it, and some just flat out ignore it. But we cannot ignore the fact that children need discipline. They need boundaries. They need structure. <clears throat> and for our family, the way that we discipline each child is different because their personalities are different. My sweet Elijah, who is my oldest, he responds well to verbal correction. He's a lot like me as far as being sensitive to others' words, but he also responds very well to having his privileges taken away. And it usually doesn't take much for him to understand his disobedience has consequences. And one thing we do is we always try to make sure our children or, children, or sit down and explain to them why he's in trouble, because I believe it's important for him to understand what he did and why he did it or why he's being punished for it so hopefully he will learn from it then we have our other precious little child ezekiel who requires a bit more than words to help him understand the consequences of his disobedience but that's mostly because he takes after his daddy just saying <laughs> y'all he's a carbon copy of his daddy <laughs> so he's two for those of you who don't know, but he's learning what he can and what he can't do. We're in that stage right now. He's learning those boundaries, and y'all, honestly, he loves doing what he's not supposed to be doing. That is his favorite thing. I can correct him over and over, and he still does it because he knows he's not supposed to do it. He loves to push those boundaries, for sure, but he is the one who requires a lot more patience from me when it comes to disciplining. disciplining. You know, I believe it's important that we bring healthy correction to our children, correct them in a loving way, and teach them why you are correcting them. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I am not the perfect mom. There have been many times that I have turned into mommy monster with my kids. <laughs> and afterwards, I have been convicted by the Holy Spirit. Like, mm -mm, you could have handled that a lot better, Ashley. So I've gone back and I have apologized to my children for handling a situation like I should. And y'all, they are so quick to forgive. It's like it never even happened and that just makes my heart melt. We are all born with a rebellious nature, but as parents, it takes a bit more patience and love from us to show our children the right way to live. We must rely on God, the Holy Spirit, and the Word to guide us when we are disciplining our children. We must also be careful not to criticize in our correction. And when I think of the word criticize, I think of comments that are they're not helpful and they actually are hurtful. And again, as mothers, I try to, as a mother, I try to explain why they're being corrected. Because when you provide feedback, you are coaching them. You're ensuring them that they're going to hopefully improve themselves from that. But when you're delivering criticism, um, that can leave your children feeling incompetent. It can leave them feeling shamed. And y'all, this world is already so critical on our children and their self-esteem. Self-esteem issues are at an all-time high right now for our kids. We must correct in love and do it biblically. So everything we do as mothers matters. The way we confront a situation, the way we speak to others, the way we dress, the way we carry ourselves, the way we correct, our children are watching our every move. They are the ones who will see us for who we truly are. We cannot say that we love God, come to church and raise our hands, but then go home and live a life that is completely contrary to the Bible. Our children get to witness our walk with Jesus. So again, I said earlier, I'm not the perfect mom and I definitely fail sometimes, but I want to live a life that's holy and pleasing to the Lord, and I strive to live a life that is a godly example to my children. And again, like I said, I'm not perfect, I fail, but I want them to carry their faith into adulthood and make their relationship with God a priority in their life and in their family. It's not guaranteed that they will be Christians, but whatever I can do right now in this moment to plant seeds and make a difference, I am going to do that. Jesus set an example for us. He's our father and he walks the talk. 
Setting an example is crucial for our children, and we cannot fail to lean on Jesus. Just because you're a Christian, because you're a Christian, doesn't mean that your children are going to be. And that's even that's why it's even more important that our godly example is needed. So I finish this point with uh, point number two with this scripture. It's Titus two verse seven. It says, "Always set an example by doing good things. When you teach, be an example of a moral purity and dignity." So point number three. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. As, as mothers, we are our children's comforter. So we've got helper, corrector, and now our own comforter. So the Holy Spirit comforts us. In John 14, verse 16, it says, And I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Jesus asks the Father to send the Holy Spirit to be with the disciples and then eventually to all of those who believe in Christ. The Holy Spirit would bring comfort in Jesus' physical absence. The Holy Spirit works from inside and does what Christ would do from the outside, teach, convict, remind, and guide. Every single person who believes would be filled with the Holy Spirit and have their own personal connection with God, no matter where you're at or, or when. And I talked about that connection in the first point. We can pray and ask the Holy Spirit to teach, convict, remind, and guide us with the Word of God and take comfort in knowing that He is there to help us. So how do mothers reflect the Holy Spirit as a comforter? In Isaiah 66, verse 12 through 13, it says, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you shall nurse, you shall be carried upon her hip and bounced upon her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. So if you go and read chapter 66 of Isaiah, prophet Isaiah is talking about the new heaven and the new earth. He is comparing bringing forth the new heaven and the new earth to bringing forth a child in childbirth. In verse 13, it says, as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. We know that Isaiah was a prophet and God gave these words to Isaiah. So the I will comfort you is God comforting his people. But let's look back at the beginning of that verse. It says, as one whom comforts his, uh, one whom his mother comforts. There is something so very special about a mother who comforts her child. Nothing matches the comfort of a mother. Even God recognizes that. God uses the maternal symbol to represent his own ability to comfort his children. Isn't that just so awesome? We are able to comfort our children when we bring security, love, peace, physical touch, gentle speech, and attention to them. They crave our attention. So uh, just this past Monday, I had to do some serious comforting to my oldest son, Elijah. As most of you know, we have decided to add lots of baby chickens to our family. <laughs> and so Elijah took to one particular chicken out of all 14 chickens. He took to this one particular chicken, and it was his favorite. He like named her five different names. I mean, he, he loved this little chicken. Well, this past Monday, I noticed that she started acting a little different. She wasn't as active as the others, and I just kind of decided to keep an eye on her, and we'll see how she was doing the next day. Well, Tuesday morning came around, and I went out there to check on her and noticed that she really hadn't improved. So there was really nothing I could have done at that point because I was getting ready to take Ezekiel to Mother's Day out, and I needed to get um, here to the church for work. So I decided, well, when I get home, I will I'll syringe feed some electrolytes, and we'll you know go from there and see. Well, that afternoon, we got home, and I immediately jumped out and ran to go check on her, and unfortunately, she didn't make it. And, you know, I wouldn't have been super upset about it, but it was Elijah's favorite chicken. Out of all the chickens, that little chicken had to go. So we broke the news to him. And, y'all, to look at his poor face and the emotions about the loss of his sweet chicken just crushed me. And it was in that moment I realized that was his uh, first true experience with grief. And as a mother, I wanted nothing more than to take that pain for him. So I scooped him up as we sat down, and I hugged him tightly, and I cried with him. 
We prayed for God to send comfort and peace to him. I encouraged him and told him how blessed that little chicken was to have him take care of her for as long as he did and how blessed she was to have all five of those names. And we went (laughs) that afternoon. (laughs) We spent the afternoon just loving on each other. And he had his moments of grief where it kind of would come in waves. But he's doing better now. So thank goodness. I told him, he said, you've got 13 other chickens to help me love on and take care of. But later that evening, I thought about the whole situation, and the thought crossed my mind. I get to be the one who brings comfort to my children. I get to be the one who helps him be comforted and help him have peace and help him walk through that sad situation. I get to be the one that shows him love when he's hurting like that. I get to be the one who wipes away his tears, and that's so special to me. And I think about how as a human can bring such comfort to another human, but I also think about how our God and how he wants to do the same for us when we are hurting and our hearts are broken and the tears are just flowing. Second Corinthians um, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. He comforts us because he loves us. And I'm about to close. Christopher, if you go ahead and come to the platform and the musicians can come. So you may be sitting there thinking, you know, all this sounds good, but I'm a struggling mom right now. I know this is what I'm supposed to be doing as a mom, but I'm not. I'm not the greatest helper. I'm not the greatest teacher to my children. I get frustrated. I may show correction too hard, or I may not be very good at comforting my children. And honestly, I feel like I'm just past the point of no return. I've messed my kids up. First and foremost, you are never past the point of no return. If we look back in Genesis, At Eve, we see that the first mother of the Bible had some struggles. She failed the test of temptation. She was kicked out of her home in the garden. She and her husband struggled. She lost a child to murder. Her other child was cursed. She went through some things, but she persevered. She pushed through. She was blessed with another son whose line the Messiah would eventually be born. And she told her family about the love of God. If God can do what he did for Eve and continue to show love, grace, and mercy to her and her family after they failed in the garden, then there is always, always hope. So you may not be the mama you thought you should be, but we have a Jesus who has set us free and has made us whole through him. I'll be the first one to admit that I have not lived out these points perfectly with my own children. All we can do is look to Jesus, pray, and seek the word, and ask the Holy Spirit to work in us. We as mothers cannot mother effectively or efficiently if we are not seeking out an intimate relationship with the Lord. Inevitably, we're going to fall, and we're going to mess up again. But just like we as mothers would bend down and scoop up our sweet babies because they've messed up, our Father in Heaven wants nothing more than to bend down and pick us up, dust the dirt off, and wrap his loving arms around us. We may not have perfect faith, but we can have sincere faith, and God sees your heart. Motherhood is hard, but it's a holy calling, and thank goodness we have a Holy Spirit to help guide us through this incredible journey. For any mother, whether you have biological children, stepchildren, your single mom, a mom who has adopted or fostered, or a grandparent raising her grandbabies, or an aunt raising children that, aren't, that are your uh, nieces or nephews. Thank you. Thank you for all the hard work that you do. Motherhood is a beautiful calling that has been placed in our lives, and one that we must never take for granted. So I'm gonna leave you with this quote. It's from a founder of a ministry that I absolutely love. Her name is Gretchen Soffels, and her ministry is called Well Watered Women. She is a mother of three, with her youngest being just about six or seven weeks old. She's in a season of exhaustion right now. And she wrote this um, passage out of that season of exhaustion. 
And when I read it, it just melted me and reminded me of his goodness, no matter what is going on in life. And so it's a personal prayer of Psalms 23. She took it, Psalms 23, and made it into a personal prayer. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack no good thing. In the morning, in the evening, in the middle of the night, in the middle of the day, he is with me even when I do not feel his presence. He makes me lie down in green pastures even when I don't want to stop and rest. He knows what's best when I think I know better. He invites me to embrace my limits and be sheltered by his tender care. He leads me beside still waters and he restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness toward the way of the eternal kingdom, all for his name's sake. Everything my shepherd does is according to his name. He never contradicts himself. He is always good. As I walk these paths, shadows come and threaten my peace and my joy. They are terrifying in that moment, but they are just shadows. A shadow cannot hurt me when I am covered by God's grace. So I won't fear evil because my shepherd is with me. He comforts, he corrects, and he restores me with his rod and with his staff. He even prepares a feast for me to, at his table in the presence of my enemies. The truest feast is found in his presence. His word nourishes my soul like no other can. Surely, without a doubt, his goodness and mercy will chase after me and accompany me on this journey every day, every moment. One day I will dwell with him in the new heavens and the new earth forever where there are no more dark shadows, no more pain, and no more fear. Until then, I will walk with my shepherd, be led by my shepherd, and call out to my shepherd who became like me, a sheep, as the lamb who was slain for my redemption. There is no greater love than my shepherd's love and no greater sacrifice than his. Yes, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack no good thing because I have everything I need in him.